Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us in today's edition of Google's African Entrepreneurship Speaker Series, Hustle Academy Brings You. My name is Sharon Mashira, and I'm super excited to be moderating this conversation with a wonderful female entrepreneur. And I'll take this moment to invite her to the stage. Her name is Patricia Okello. Patricia, come through. Hi. Hi. Welcome. Have a seat. Thank you very much. Cool. Patricia, it's such a pleasure to meet you today. Thank you. And, me, and the pleasure is mine as well. Being a woman in business, being an entrepreneur, 22 years, that's quite, you know, the legacy, right? Take me back to the beginning. Um, what inspired you to get on that path? Um, I actually I consider myself an accidental entrepreneur. Okay. Um, I, I'm a, I studied fine art and had gone into the media space of media because I had majored in graphic design and joined the, one of the largest media houses here in Nairobi. And um, I thought that was going to be my life, you know, going into media, going into um, advertising, and yeah, that's, the, that's the creative life I was going to live. But um, the year I joined this media house I, was the same year that my husband proposed to me, and it became apparent that I will be required to move to another town because he was not living in Nairobi at the time. And fortunately, um, his family is an entrepreneurial family. And um, his, my mother-in-law encouraged me and my father-in-law encouraged me to think of um, a business as an option, you know, because I had been doing my own thing, you know, graphic design, you kind of create things, you're selling things for years, you know. And so they were like, you can do that on your own. You don't have to work for someone um, for that to happen. So I can say that's the thing that pushed me um, into entrepreneurship and eventually starting with our Productions, which is the first business that I, I, I ran. And um, yeah, I didn't give it a lot of thought. Yeah. It just accidental entrepreneur. Accident I like that. Mm -hmm. I think uh, I might borrow that one day. Yeah. <laughs> and tell me, you know, when you were thinking about setting up your business and setting it up for growth, Mm -hmm. I'm guessing as an accidental entrepreneur, those are not things that oh, no. were. No. So how did you manage to, you know, sort of scale it to where it is today? That's interesting. And um, I think the jury is still out when you talk about scaling. Uh -huh. But um, be when I started the business, I was the designer, the driver, the marketer. Yeah. And, you know, um, the delivery guy. And um, as the business grew, I just started filling in those little spots, you know, because you become mm -hmm. too busy to be able to do those, the, all those, all those things. So of course you begin to hire. I remember my first uh, employee; I had to train her um, to to do design work, as well as do all the other things that she needed to do in the office when I wasn't there. And slowly by slowly, you just begin to uh, to uh, to grow the team. So the core team was really around the studio. And then I had, I think, three designers and then started building, uh, because I'm not very good with finances, mm -hmm. so in my background, I, I hired my first real hire after the designers would be an accountant. Wow. So the business just grew um, organically um, over the years. Of course, at, the, at our largest, we were about 22, 23 em employees. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you know, the um, ebbs and flows of life, you, sometimes you have to scale down, sometimes you grow the team, yeah. And, you know, you've touched on something really important, which is... Um finances or financing mm -hmm. so how did you finance your your business or access finance um i think that's always an important yeah. you know point to to, yeah. to discuss you know yeah, it is um i was really fortunate i remember the first time my the first computer i i owned my husband is son who took a, a sacco loan um that time uh, personal computers were really expensive so that was like the first big thing so he was maybe the first investor if you want to say <laughs> and then um uh, the business really grew organically so we were uh, everything ev all the money that we came in we kept putting it back into the business yeah so i remember it took me almost 3 or 4 years to pay to start paying myself so the advice that we hear is as an entrepreneur always pay yourself first well i clearly didn't read that book <laughs> so the only thing that i kept dreaming um, the thing kept me up at night would yeah. be can i pay my salaries for the, the little team that i had so really we kept plowing back everything that we earned back into the business and i didn't need to um, look for external financing outside of family until i wanted to invest in my first uh, machine at that time uh, digital printing was becoming all the rave and we could, uh, you know, large printing machines could now be owned um, by individuals. So I think for me, my first, um, the first investment was around the printing for branded items and then eventually going into digital large format printing. And that was financed by a bank. Yeah. And um, that's a story in itself. But I, it was financed by a bank. And that's when I really now went out to look for um, external funding. Right. Yeah. And um, I realize maybe we've not really explained in detail what, um, what what you do, what your business is. So do you mind just letting us yeah. know 
um, yeah, what conferencing in a box is or Willard Productions. Yes. So I'll, I'll talk about Willard first. So Willard was just an offshoot of my own skill set, which is um, graphic design, offering graphic design services. At that time, a lot of large organizations were going into a Basically, when not only using agencies, because agencies you have to use retain, you have to pay retainers, etc. That was the, the tradition at that time. So what I came into the market saying is that you can get this great services, but you don't, you can just pay as you go, right? And so that's what we brought into the market as a kind of like a new um, thing, and would go out and start looking for business from corporates to just you know give get a, give a designer the job. And then uh, produce the work, hopefully, and, and deliver. Initially, I actually only thought that the only thing I'd be required to do was do design work and then either deliver it on a floppy drive or a CD. Floppy That's drive. it. Yeah, yeah. That <laughs> tells my age. Yeah. <laughs> and then um, I, uh, quickly, I, I started realizing that people don't put, don't invest uh, money when it comes to just design. You have to kind mm -hmm. of like give them something physical. And so I started venturing back into, you know, print. And when I went into print is when the opportunities to buy equipment then came to the fore. So I would do the design work of maybe uh, pamphlets, you know, brochures. Those days we used to print everything, posters, <laughs> etc. And then we started doing a back integration into the business and seeing mm -hmm. what, how can I retain more of the, of the money that I was paying out to suppliers. And that's how the whole idea came of um, investing in uh, digital equipment. Conference in a Box didn't come until 12 years later into running Willard. And that really came as a result of literally looking at your numbers and sitting with an, 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 you know, an, a finance person and saying, hey, look, Pat, if you invest more time in this area, because it looks like this, this product is a, prof a profitable product, how about if you invest more time in this events and corporate events business? And it, we'll probably see your business grow you know, uh, much faster. At the time, I needed a completely different skill set, yeah, because I was working more with the creatives and what we call below the line advertising. While for the conference and events, because we would be dealing with corporates, we needed an, a different level of uh, human resource for that. So I had to separate the two uh, brands, and that's how really conferencing in a box was birthed. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. Um, and I think because you're you're running two businesses in somewhat different verticals, I'd love for you to talk to us about what you think are some of the mistakes you made um, as an entrepreneur and how you could potentially correct them, you know, with hindsight? For me, I, I, I really struggle with the word mistakes mm -hmm. because maybe that's just being an eternal optimist and looking at it more as lessons. And because I was starting my business mm -hmm. when I was also starting my married life, yeah, which means um, young children are coming, you know, giving birth to young children, then I felt that uh, the growth of the business had to kind of like be, I don't want to call it stunted, but certainly had to hold back on growth uh, simply because I, I wanted to be a present wife and I wanted to be a present mother, but I also wanted to run a really good business. So um, keeping my business small at that time um, made sense to me. Of course, now in hindsight, and especially in 12 years later and, and, and running Conference in a Box, I realized that, that there are other things that I could have done um, including getting maybe a, a co-founder or, you know, uh, those kind of things were not available at the time or I didn't have those ideas. Mm. But of course, um, those are some of the things I think I would have done sooner is get a partner, um, um, you know, collaborate more with other designers and other like-minded people who were also uh, offering the same services at the time. And I think we, I would have been able to grow the business much faster um, had I done that. But yeah, those are some of the lessons. I like it. And, you know, as as an entrepreneur, how do you balance um, between those sort of big um, entrepreneurship questions like strategy, scaling versus your sort of day-to-day -day operational questions? Yeah. 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 I don't know. I, I, I Sometimes I wonder about those things because I learned them much later, <laughs> deep into my business. And I'm thinking, I don't know if it's my creative side, mm -hmm. but um, I just felt that you just, if you have an idea, just bring it to market and learn, you know, people will tell you if it works or not. And I think um, listening to what customers are saying, listening to what's happening in your industry, uh, for me, if you want to call it strategy, I guess then use that term. But that's what I did. I listened a lot to what was happening around the industry at the time. If I saw products that I had never seen before, I would ask questions. How was this done? How is this produced? Um, uh, you know, going for trade fairs. Um, I would go to Dubai every beginning of the year. They have a huge graphic ex expo there. And it just became part of the things that I was doing as a, as a founder to grow and to learn more. I think um, the, the idea of strategy really came, I would say, when I started. And I, OK, I was making strategic decisions, but mm -hmm. I didn't know. For example, because I was running a business that 
that, that was small and I wanted to keep it small, I didn't pitch to large corporates for work. I started, I realized quickly that it, if I worked with not-for-profits, they were more interested in relationships than where corporates who are looking at KPIs and things like mm. that. So I quickly realized, okay, I'm not big enough yet for the corporate world, although I had corporate clients when I started my business, but just started scaling down and working with not-for-profits, building relationships. A lot of the people that I worked with um, at the beginning remain my friends till today. So we really built um, and invested in relationships. And if that's a strategy, then you can call it that. Yeah. And then it wasn't until 12 years later now, I, I had had my two, my, uh, two daughters that I then had time that I could you know, spend more time and probably when I started Conference in a Box, I could spend more time with corporates that are, corporate work is really demanding. Yeah, mm -hmm. Very, very, a lot of politics, a lot of things that you're fighting in the corporate space and I could now invest more in that and then look for the, the right you know, um, uh, skill sets for that business. So, that, so that's what is distinctly different in, in my growth strategies for the two businesses. Yeah. Wow. And what about um, you know, digital channels? Um, could you tell us a little bit about how digital channels and digital tools can help you grow your business, run your business? Um, have you used some digital tools? And if so, just tell us a little bit about what that's been like for you and for your business. Yes. You know, when we started Willa, we literally, I, I don't even know if you'll understand this, Sharon. We <laughs> you said floppy disks, so yeah, I'm familiar with it. We used to dial it. up for internet. <laughs> I don't know. You have to understand where we're coming from. And we would, yes, yeah, so we, we weren't online all the time. If you wanted yeah. to go online, you had to dial up and then the emails would be downloaded onto your machine and then you'd respond. And that's just the era. We had fax machines. So people would fax, we'd fax designs to clients and they'd fax it back, etc. Yeah. And, um, but one of the tools that I still think was really but one of the things we did is we would spam people. At that time, it wasn't called spam. It was called marketing. Okay, <laughs> So we would really spam people. But that's how we actually, the first funnel we used to generate, um, to get uh, customers. Yeah. And people would respond to spam, believe mm, it or not. Wow. So you, you would craft a really, a really nice um, email, a letter, and attach a nice document. Because we were creatives, we could attach a nice document to it. And then people would then ask you, how did you do that, et cetera. And that would really, uh, was really how the business grew. So... Email marketing is still a thing, even till, um, till today. In fact, we have higher conversions on email marketing than in any other channel. Of course, as social media became a thing, um, we jumped onto, I think, the Facebook. But we never thought about Facebook and stuff like that for, for business. No, we never thought about that. Social media really became a thing, I think, much later when people began to see the, the, the link between um, a customer and, um, and selling a product to that person on the other side of it so, and, and less suspicion being treated with it. So I think for me... Um, that's how it really it really started. So yes, we um, use a lot of that. And then of course, having presence, there's now a time for people to see if you were legit, you had to have a website, for example, mm -hmm. of course, such engines were now becoming all the raven. So you now needed to have a website. So the first thing now, I remember when we started um, uh, Conference in a Box was to, um, to build a website, but that wasn't the first thing when we were doing Willard. Website came much later for Willard, but for Conference in because it was, we were doing work across borders, the first thing we had to do is um, to build a website. Right. And from there, and, and, and people started looking at credibility using a website. And of course, now when we went into Kayana, which is now um, what we've been working on the last three years, it's everything. Mm. Yeah, I mean, those are the channels where we attract all our audiences, how we find female entrepreneurs in the work that we're doing, etc. I mean, that's the only way. That was the first thing we did even before we opened Office Space, yeah. Wow, and you know, you've talked about social media, digital tools like email marketing, mm. how do you identify the next sort of growth horizon or the next growth opportunity for your business? You know, one of the things that I've noticed over the 22 years is the, the foundation remains the same and it's still relational. I work with a lot of young people and I have to almost explain to them what a relationship is. <laughs> did, you, did, you send, did you send this information to so-and-so? Yeah. How did you send it? send them a text and they haven't responded. Oh, did you ever think of just picking up the phone and calling them? And they're like, ah, oh, okay. Hmm. So um, I still feel relationships will never, will still be a thing. Right. Right. And um, I think investing in relationships will, is, and we're seeing it even in the, in the events industry. We've, I mean, we've been so busy for the past six, seven months, just one event, in-person event after the other. And so many customers saying that we don't want virtual meetings. We don't even want hybrid. We'd rather have small, intimate uh, meetings with the real people in the room where we can now begin to make meaningful connections. So I feel that that, uh, that will still remain the same. How we connect may change, but face-to-face -face interactions will still become, will still be a big part of, um, of the world we live in yeah. um, in terms of intimacy and authenticity, et cetera. But that's not discounting technology. And of mm -hmm. course, the role technology has done. 
I call it the great um, accelerator mm -hmm. because um, a, a business that took 12 years to build with Conscious in a Box, for example, we were doing double our turnover within three years simply because of, of technology. So technology, I, I feel, accelerates growth, but relationships will still need, um, will still be the traditional types of connections. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that, actually. Mm. And, you know, just on a more sort of um, futuristic thought, what's what's your vision for small business owners in Africa? Wow. I, you know, I'd say small business is big business. That's, I mean, that's my hashtag. Yeah. Wherever you find me on LinkedIn, I'm always talking about that, especially for Africa. There's a, there's a romanticization that has, if that's a word, that has come around entrepreneurship, yeah. which, um, you know, and the startup world of, you know, you know come up, yeah, just come up with your idea and, you know, fundraise for it. <laughs> and then boom. And, and then boom. And I, for me, I really still feel there's a space for traditional um, small businesses mm. that can grow, but they're just the traditional style. You know, you know that acceleration of growth will not be like you know the unicorns we're seeing, which is really what one two percent of ideas. So I feel for Africa because Africa is so rich in human resources, and in a young population, I think we really, really need to encourage a sense of entrepreneurship in every, in all our young people, especially if you have a skill set. Um, we were just talking earlier about you know if you if you have you've been given a gift, um, you know like. For me, it was graphic design. For somebody else, it may be, you know, film, et cetera. And learning, putting business skills into the thinking around what mm -hmm. you're doing. I was talking to the makeup artist earlier and, and listening to her story around how she um, started her business. So this, the core of business skills, I think, is a big part of what we should be uh, sharing with young people. You know, just, you know, basic um, understanding your your money, understanding marketing, and sales, understanding consistency and systems. I think that is something that we should still continue to speak to small businesses about. And um, that's where the growth is, is really in the small, small, small business. And when I talk small, it's not necessarily turnover, employing, you know, two to five people in your business, consistently paying them an income. Mm -hmm. The change that it will make on, on econ economies is something I really, really deeply believe in. Right. And just, you know, to further build on that um, and based on that vision, what do you hope or what do you see that, or what do you hope could change, mm -hmm. right, to make it more conducive for for small businesses to be big business, as you said? Yeah, I think for me, I, the big thing and the biggest problem is just doing business across borders in Africa. Mm. It is just, we're just laughing and, with a friend of mine and saying how they were tra traveling, I think, to Senegal and had to go to Paris and then Paris to wow. Dakar. And that was her cheapest route, you know, and I think... That's where now our issues um, in terms of Africa comes in. Just last mile delivery, for example. Um, you have great products. You, how do you get them to the person right to the dots, doorstep? I mean, mm -hmm. there's so many obstacles that come in. Here in Kenya, we have issues just moving from one county to another because every county you move your product to, there's a cess or a tax that's taxed on it. And making um, scaling and growing outside really, really difficult. So if you look at people who are delivering, doing last mile delivery, they will tell you the challenges they face and, you know, just anything outside the, the you know, tier cities becomes very difficult. So I think um, um, things like bilateral trade agreements that we're doing with Western countries, we also need to do them within Africa. I think there's the AFTA I, that I hear people talking about. I haven't experienced it yet, but it's a big thing in terms of trading just within um, African borders, which is great when you write it and sign it. But how practical, what happens when you're practically trying to move a product from Nairobi to Kigali or to Congo or to, you know, Lagos, the, the obstacles are immense, really. Mm. Yeah. And people find it much easier to move to Europe and then bring it back to Africa. Yeah. Right. Which is great. wild it's, to me. It's wild. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I, I want us to move the conversation to a little bit more of your niche, which is being a creative entrepreneur mm -hmm. in Africa. Mm -hmm. What unique challenges um, come from that, you know, world of yeah. creative entrepreneurship yeah. in Africa, you know? I think because um, when I speak 22 years ago, I won't even ask you where you were, Sharon, 22 <laughs> years ago. But telling a parent that you're doing, you're going into the creative sp space was very difficult. What is really nice now is parents and, uh, and caregivers are seeing um, children make money from like, you know, uh, yeah. YouTube, for TikTok, example. Yeah, yeah exactly. Mm. And so I think people, in fact, I, I think it, parents are encouraging their children to do cre uh, much more creative things than just, you know, being in the classroom and, you know, starting to become, you know, a traditional career like doctor, lawyer, etc. I think the catch is, is, um, is the concentration span of young people. And, you know, uh, running a business is uh, boring, believe it or not, because <laughs> you have to repeat, to do repetitive, repetitive work 
um, somebody needs to know when they pick up the call on the other side that they will find, find Sharon offering the services that she said she right. was doing. It doesn't matter what you're doing, whether you're a tattoo artist, whether you're a sculptor, it doesn't matter. Will I find you when I pick up the phone and I want your services? And I think that's for me, um, um, I would, for, I mean, all my children, I, I encourage them to study whatever they, you know, they really, they want to study. Although tr at the back of my mind, I'm always like, what is the thing you will do and not grow bored of doing yeah, quickly? Every day. Yeah, every day. And then what is it that you love so much? Like my son loves to build Legos. I mean, he can spend hours, like five, six hours doing Legos, but asking to sit down and read for those five hours, forget it. <laughs> not happening. So you kind of like need something that is somebody's naturally inclined to and then encourage them. Um, okay, this is what you really do. How do you do it to a, a point of excellence? Mm -hmm. And then ultimately to, um, to be able to now then earn a living from your skill. Yeah, amazing. And, you know, even as we conclude, what would be your challenge to the audience listening here and at home um, from your 22 years doing this? Mm -hmm. What would be your challenge to, to our listeners? Yeah. So one of the things that um, I'm doing now, which we haven't really talked about, is encouraging young entrepreneurs um, female, specifically female entrepreneurs to kind of like um, um, bring their idea to life, yeah, so to speak, yeah. And I always tell people, if you have this innate idea that's inside you, don't die with it. Just, just try it, test it, bring it to the market and test it. And don't be sensitive when you get feedback because, and it doesn't have to be perfect. Don't, bring, don't wait for it to be like 100% perfect. 60% ready, bring it to market. The 40% will be filled by the, by your, um, by the customer. So just be ready to listen to the feedback and to keep building and rebuilding on whatever the product is. Everybody has something that makes them really, truly unique. And the more we see unique ideas coming to, to I mean, being birthed, as I say, mm -hmm. um, the better it is for our economies. Yeah. I love it. So, Patricia, you know, as you've said, you know, a few years ago, we didn't have access to as much information or resources. Um, what would be your advice to people in the audience and watching from wherever they're watching this from? How can they tap into, you know, the resources and technology that have been made available um, for them? Yeah. You know, I'm, um, I'm such a beneficiary of um, a lot of free stuff. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. All my skills training in, in terms of um, business was all so it was an opportunity that was offered. I then applied and then got in. And you'll be amazed at how many people do not uh, apply for, I don't know, for whatever reason, they don't apply. And, and so now I think one of the things that we've really benefited from, um, especially I'll speak a little bit about Kayana, which is our um, accelerator for female entrepreneurs. We always have a skills training um, session for entrepreneurs. And um, many times our resource people are actually from Google. And um, one of the big ones was uh, Google, uh, Google Digital Skills Training for Entrepreneurs, where we are, you know, the entrepreneurs are trained on how to take advantage of things like um, a search engine optimization and, you know, stuff like that, and which is really, really effective uh, for their business. And of course, now I, we've already talked about um, uh, the University of, of YouTube. YouTube. <laughs> and now, of course, with the Hustle Academy, things that are really just being um, specifically designed and created uh, for entrepreneurs, yeah? And I think if you become really good in something, because there's so many people who are not going to jump on it, you can actually earn from it, yeah? You become an expert in it, uh, and you can actually be paid for um, for the work they're doing. So, I, I mean, that's some, those are some of the things that really encourage people to jump on um, immediately, yeah. Great. So, you know, you are a creative, and you mentioned earlier this idea of passion projects. Yeah. How do you go about determining whether something is a passion project, just do it for fun as a hobby, or should you monetize it and turn it into a business? Because mm -hmm. I think as a multifaceted generation, we find ourselves so good at so many different things, but it's hard to determine what is a viable business and what isn't. Okay, yeah, and not falling in love with your business. Right. So one of the big things is, um, is anybody willing to pay you for what you're offering. One of the things we always uh, speak about with entrepreneurs that come into our space is proof of concept, yeah? So we're, we're, if you're saying that, oh, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm going to be making these like jams or creams or shea butters, et cetera, and we're like, has anybody, have you mi mixed them? Yeah, yeah, I've been mixing them. And uh, has any, have people used them? Yeah, the users say that it's really wonderful and it's great. Um, did you give them out for free? Yes, I give them out for free as gifts. Has anybody come back to order and reorder from you? So that's like on a really basic level, because at least you'll know if somebody who's, first of all, not your relative, 
<laughs> um, I was asking you to create something, uh, I mean, to pay money for something. I think that's already a sign that uh, people are willing to part with their hard and uh, money for that. Then the second thing um, I, would, I, I would also think through when you're talking about a business is, have you found a way to consistently produce this, that item many mm. times? So there's, when, you're, when you're producing something to sell, that experience needs to be predictable, right? If somebody likes your cakes, or I have a friend who does fantastic lemon tea cakes, yeah? And when I order from her, I don't want today for the lemony to be lemony, and then tomorrow <laughs> I can barely taste it. You want that predictability. Consistency. That when I eat them, the consistency. When I present it in front of my guests, the same taste and experience that I have had when I, I taste a product. So there's, you need to have, um, you need to, when you're, when you're creating stuff, you can test, test, test. But when you're beginning to sell and people are paying you, it has to be consistent. It has to be a predictable experience. You don't want to like board a plane and today the journey is smooth. The other day the pilot didn't show up. It didn't leave on time. It's the same thing with small businesses. That predictability in um, the user experience is extremely, is extreme, extremely important. As they say, you should reduce as much friction as, uh, as possible. So those are the, some of the things that I would definitely... Advice, document, document, even when you're iterating, even when you're creating new products, um, consistently document what, you, what it is you're doing. I think it's great to produce a product. Let's say, you're, let's say I'm talk, let me talk about shea butters. If you produce and you're able to do, let's say, 20 in one mixing, yeah, and they sell out, don't say, okay, I've sold out and that was my goal. No, I mean, mm -hmm. if you are you're able to do 40 or 80 in a month, embrace that and, and learn from that experience and you'll see, okay, fine, is, is there a trend, a data? What is the data like? Are people buying during certain seasons? Are they buying for themselves to use? So keeping track of, um, of the response to your product is also a very key part um, in, in building that business. Yeah. Amazing. And just a um, question on mentorship. How important have mentors been uh, in your 22-year journey as an entrepreneur? And how can young people go about identifying mentors? Okay. Um, mentorship is something that comes up a lot with uh, this generation. And um, for me, it's everything. Having um, people who have gone before me in whatever journey, be it in growing and scaling your business, be it in leading teams, be it in um, um, exposure and experience, it's everything. I mean, when I tell my story around my, uh, my, my business and how I got into corporates, it was really somebody hand-holding the process of me getting and working and understanding the inter intricate ways mm -hmm. in which the corporates run that have that really helped me and you know some of this experience you can only you can only have it if somebody's willing to to work with you even when you're making mistakes yeah or even um being able to ask around okay now i've gotten this great order how do you think i should go about it na 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 you know that 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 is a fantastic i think mentors are just everything for small mm -hmm. and uh and micro businesses and then um my advice to young people when you're looking for mentors is something that somebody taught taught me a long time ago is when you're looking or um, searching for a mentor and you finally do get your opportunity to find one, um, remember the process is driven by you and not the mentor. The mentor is minding their own business and doing <laughs> their own thing. You're the one who's come to them to ask them for, for, you know, for time. And so you must really be very deliberate in, um, in, in the questions that you will ask and the, the, the point of assistance that you want. What is it specifically that you found that you, know, you want Sharon to do and to help you with? Very, very important for um, a mentee to understand um, that process. Um, and many people want to help, but, you know, sometimes you feel like your time is not being valued, yeah? Um, um, you know, people come in late. Uh, we have sessions for one of the, the mentorship um, organizations that I run, and people just, young people don't understand the value of having this resource in front of you, coming in late for their meetings, um, ill-prepared, um, no questions, um, and just little things like that that uh, you know don't work. And I'd even say, before you look for a physical mentor, go online and look for somebody online who's already sharing their skills with such abandon, and follow them. For me, one of the my, the women that I just absolutely love and admire is uh, Sarah Blakely of Spanx. Yeah, mm. I've never met her, but she shares her entrepreneurial journey so openly, and I even consider her a personal mentor because I, she shares her her experience as a wife, as a mother, and then of running a business. So look for some of those mentors who are already there who you can learn from and then before you now come and ask somebody to spend you know 30 40 minutes with you and i i think for me and the people the people i've mentored the value really um, comes in when you have somebody who's really invested in uh, in learning and growing themselves and you get such a satisfaction when you meet somebody like that yeah amazing 
being a, a, a female entrepreneur on the continent presents its whole, you know, myriad of challenges that are specific to being a woman entrepreneur. What advice would you have for people in the audiences, women that are in business or are perhaps interested in getting in business? Start now. <laughs> <laughs> Start today. We don't have enough um, uh, female entrepreneurs um, out there. Um, women, we tend to overthink things. Or, uh, in fact, one of the things that I, the word I try to avoid is perf perfectionism. Um, there's a sense that, I don't know, we have to get it, all the ducks in a row before we bring something to market. And I'm just like, kill that story. Just, you know, if you have a good idea, as I said, um, if you have people asking you to do something um, and you can monetize it, just start. Start with it small. Don't be fearful, because one of the things that I was very, very fearful when I started uh, Willard was the idea of being taken away from my family and away from my husband and away from my children. It was a real, real thing, um, and even away from my parents. And um, I, I think it shouldn't hold you back. I think the beauty about life is things actually work themselves out. And uh, when that prob problem arrives, you will find a way to deal with it. So I'm, I'm just like, you know what, let's just go ahead. Let's build um, big businesses. Don't take my advice. Build big businesses. <laughs> um, um, partner with people as early as possible because women, we love to do things in groups. And you may not get the first, your first partner may not be great, but there are lessons you'll learn from that um, that partnership that will you build other partnerships as well. So that's the first thing I'd say. Don't be too worried about um, about uh, not being available for especially for your children. The fact that you're conscious of it, that the con you're conscious of that you want to be present for them, you will be naturally present. You know, somebody um, I remember uh, a counselor telling me that children just want 20 minutes of your undivided time. So if even just committing to 20 minutes every day with your children, undivided attention, no laptop, no phone, etc., you will be you're already being a present parent and be OK with that. Yeah. Um, if you have a good we live in Africa, so we generally have um, a, a really great support system underneath us. Take advantage of that of that. The guilt will be with you. You will walk with that guilt. It's just something that will be a part of you. But don't let it hinder you from growing and starting your business. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think on that note, I'd like to take this opportunity to say a big thank you. Um, I'm sure as of many people, we've all learned so much by this session. Um, and yeah, thank you everyone for joining us. This has been, you know, Google's African Entrepreneurship Speaker Series called Hustle Academy Brings You. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you very much.